Okay, good afternoon everyone. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, as the organizer of this event, I have the pleasure to welcome you to the discussion panel uh, the sovereignty dispute over the Falklands Malvinas, competing claims, and prospects of settlement. Um, this panel forms part of the course International Law Globalization, also of the course Business Settlement, both courses from the Master Program Globalization and Law of Maastricht University, as many among you are aware. Um, also, as some people here may know, the um, dispute, this sovereignty dispute over the Falklands Malvinas has opposed the United Kingdom and Argentina for, say, about 200 years now. And this makes it one of the oldest uh, territorial disputes, as well as one of the hardest to settle. This dispute is a recurrent topic of discussion in many international forums, such as the UN General Assembly, the UN Decolonization Committee, and the Organization of American States. Furthermore, I could say that this discussion panel cannot be a time here. Um, on the one hand, um, the panel will touch upon a series of grand themes of international law uh, that we, you and me, and also uh, Professor Wilmar, uh, have examined with you last week in the context of our courses International Law and Globalization and Dispute Settlement. I can refer, for example, to topics such as tension between territorial integrity and the right of self-determination, I can also refer to the scope of the principle of the peaceful settlement of international disputes. Um, besides, um, this panel is timely, very timely, because um, the dispute, this dispute, this sovereignty dispute, has been heating up last year due to uh, two number of factors. I can mention the strong determination of one of the parties to, dispute, uh, to the dispute to launch a sovereignty talks. I can refer to um, the organization of a so-called referendum on self-determination in the islands last year. I could also refer to the unilateral exploitation of natural non-renewable resources in the island. All this made um, our topic the topic which is gathering here uh, us today, uh, a very timely discussion panel. <coughs> now, this panel, this panel will be chaired by my colleague, Jure Hirman, Professor of International Law at Maastricht University. I would like now to, introduce, to, to um, uh, invite Professor Wilmer to introduce our guest speakers, um, the topics of the presentation, as well as the sequence of discussion. So, Professor Wigmar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fabian, uh, for this introductory work. And I would first like to thank Fabian for organizing this event. This cold talk is uh, very much Fabian's baby, and I'm glad it is uh, so well attended. Um, so, to, the topic is about a dispute over some islands in southern Atlantic, the Falklands in English or Malvinas in Spanish. Um, islands in plural, in fact that is an archipelago uh, comprised of two bigger islands and over 700 smaller ones. Um, the population of the territory is around 3,000 people, uh, but the islands were uninhabited prior to the arrival of Europeans and then things started to complicate. Uh, the Falklands slash Malvinas dispute is a nexus of law and politics on the questions of territorial 
entitlement, uh, colonial pedigree, uh, cell determination, and use of force. Um, our speakers will address these issues. Uh, one is a lawyer, and the other one a political scientist. Uh, one is um, Argentine originally, the other one British originally, both um, <laughs> expats and have been expats for a long time. Uh, but let me say that they're not here to uh, speak on behalf of all the governments of their nationality. Uh, they are here in their personal capacity and they're both accomplished academics in their field. Uh, Marcelo Cohen is professor of international law at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, the author of several books and articles in various areas of international law, including territorial issues, secession, and so on. On the practical side, Professor Cohen has acted as counsel and advocate in a number of cases before the International Court of Justice and other international tribunals, including those concerning territorial matters. And the other speaker is Ivan Brisco, uh, who is a senior research fellow at Klingendal um, um, Institute, the Netherlands Institute of International Relations. He holds a degree in PPE, from Modeling College Oxford. Um, and this, this degree is something you really should have if you want to enter British politics. But Ivan didn't decide to, 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 to choose this path, but actually ended up being a journalist in Buenos Aires, of all places, uh, <laughs> for some time. And then he went on to Spain. But here in the Netherlands, I should perhaps add that not because Swarte Piet would take him there, but he studied, he did another degree then at Complutense University of Madrid. Um, so we have two very prominent and internationally minded speakers here, coming from different disciplinary backgrounds, and this certainly promises very um, vivid discussion afterwards. Uh, they will go about 30 minutes each, and then I will take over with some comments, and then afterwards um, we will have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Uh, uh, Marcelo, you will go first. Yeah, so the floor is yours. Uh, Yuri for your kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here in this uh, well-known city and in this prestigious university. Um, it is my first time in Maastricht, I have to say. Um, at the outset I have to also say that it is very difficult to summarize in 30 minutes uh, a long-standing dispute uh, as uh, Fabian had said just uh, uh, some two centuries, but I will try, I will try, and I have prepared a presentation with slides. The problem is that I have 30 minutes and I have 70 slides, uh, but I will try to uh, put aside some of them. So, first of all, uh, the question of uh, the geographic location of the islands, just to give you an idea, these are the uh, islands uh, which are the object of the dispute between Argentina and the United Kingdom. They are located at about 12,000 kilometers from the UK and uh, 480 kilometers from the Argentine mainland, known as Patagonia. Maybe this uh, reflects some ideas to you. Um, uh, as you said, uh, this is an archipelago, it is composed by a number of islands and there are, these are, this is an Argentine map, Las Islas Malvinas in Spanish, and this is the British map, uh, these are the Falkland Islands. The problem, as you may see, is that they are, these are the same islands and this is the reason why there is a dispute. I believe it is not a problem with the name of the island. So they are known in Spanish as Malvinas, in British, in English, 
as the Falkland, the problem is not the name. The problem is, in fact, who owns uh, the uh, islands from the sovereignty viewpoint. Uh, Yuri said these islands are inhabited by about uh, less, indeed, than 3,000 uh, inhabitants. It is true there was no uh, original population in these islands. They were uninhabited when uh, the Europeans came uh, in the 18th century. Uh, we have to add about uh, 1,500 uh, military staff because uh, there is a military base in the islands that uh, was established by the British government after 1982 and uh, this probably gives the highest uh, ratio of uh, a soldier per inhabitant uh, all over the world. Mm? Um, the dispute have some strategic and economic importance that cannot be neglected. Uh, you have here a map of the South Atlantic, a region that uh, uh, was uh, qualified by the General Assembly Resolution 41-11 of 1986 as a zone of peace and cooperation. What we have here is a number of territories which are under the British control in which there are uh, military presence, in particular in Asc Ascension Island and in the Malvinas Falklands. Uh, the dispute, in fact, is not only with regard to the Malvinas Falklands Islands, but also two other archipelagos, which are uh, South Georgia, if I learn to use this, always dangerous, South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands. Um, and this is also the map you have in front of you. This is the British claim of the outer limits of the continental shelf. We are talking about, uh, about 3 million square kilometers of continental shelf. This is probably, this gives probably uh, the most extended territorial and maritime dispute all over the world. So this gives you an idea what we are talking about. Indeed, I had planned to divide my presentation in three parts. One concerning the titles to sovereignty, the, the legal arguments invoked by both sides with regard to sovereignty, the question of decolonization, which kind of principles should uh, be applied in order to decolonize, decolonize this territory. And the third part, uh, uh, the obligation to settle international disputes through peaceful means. I will put aside the third part because uh, I believe Ivan will focus on this aspect and probably if I have something to say, be sure I will do it during <laughs> the debate. Uh, so let me talk about the first point, the uh, titles to sovereignty invoked by both sides. I will present both uh, legal arguments and I will uh, try to explain and analyze them. Uh, first of all, you have to take into account that this dispute uh, started in 1829-1833. In 1829, there was the first British protest against uh, Argentinian display of sovereignty over the islands, and in 1833, uh, the British expelled uh, Argentina from the islands. So this is the period in which you are, most of you, or all of you maybe, are um, lawyers or law students, and you may be familiar with the technical concept the ICJ uh, often uh, uses in territorial and maritime disputes, the idea of critical date. So, uh, in order to settle a dispute, you have to determine at what moment in time you have to uh, analyze the legal arguments developed by one side and the other. So, the critical date in this dispute is 1829-1833. So, the first time in which you have both sides claiming, competing claims over the same territory. Um, Argentina 
started its uh, war of independence in 1810 and it formally declared independence in 1816. This is also a very important element, so in order to place the dispute in the historical context. Hmm? So we are talking about a dispute that emerged uh, between a very young independent republic, Argentina at that time, and the most uh, uh, important power of that time, Great Britain. Hmm? Um, what are the Argentine uh, titles invoked in order to claim sovereignty? Um, I would say they are very simple. First of all, uh, succession to Spanish sovereignty. Second, the exercise, the effective exercise by Argentina of territorial sovereignty over the islands after the independence and until 1833 when it was expelled from the island. And the fact that since uh, that time, since 1833, when it was expelled from the islands, Arge Argentina has never consented to this uh, British occupation. These are, in a nutshell, the, uh, the Argentine uh, arguments. But obviously, if Argentina claims that it succeeded in, uh, to Spanish sovereignty, you have to demonstrate first the very existence of Spanish sovereignty over the island. And uh, there are different arguments that were advanced, both by Spain and by Argentina later. One of it, one of it is discovery. I will uh, also show that uh, the British argument also invoked uh, discovery. I will come back to this in a moment. I will just simply say that this is not an essential point uh, because discovery itself is not uh, a title enough in order to claim sovereignty. But um, the Spanish argument also uh, uh, involved the recognition by the other powers of that time of the uh, presence of the uh, location of the islands within the sphere of influence of Spain and the fact that these powers recognized Spanish sovereignty in different moments. For, in, for instance, in 1749, the British government, government requested authoriz authorization to Madrid in order to send an expedition uh, to the islands. And this is a clear manifestation of British recognition of Spanish sovereignty. Indeed, the first uh, power to uh, establish a settlement in the islands, the first uh, permanent presence in the islands, human presence in the islands, uh, we put aside penguins and other kind of uh, presence. Uh, the first presence, human presence in the island was French. Mm? Uh, French established a settlement there uh, in 1764, <laughs> but the Spanish government uh, reacted, considering that these islands belong to Spain and France uh, recognized this and transferred the settlement uh, to the uh, Spaniards. So Spain can claim the fact of this first occupation. And uh, if you are familiar with uh, titles to territorial sovereignty, uh, if you consider even that the islands were terra nullius, territory without a master at that time, uh, the acquisition of territory without a master is by the fact of the first occupation. Mm -hmm. The first to arrive is the sovereign. An old uh, Roman law uh, rule that was also applied in uh, sovereignty matters. Um, after this transfer by Spain, by France, sorry, uh, Spain maintained a permanent presence in the islands. Uh, they appointed 30 uh, governors. Uh, they, these were they were appointed uh, by, uh, in Buenos Aires. Uh, the islands were part of the vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata. Uh, the uh, administrative uh, uh, unit, uh, which later on uh, constituted essentially Argentina, but also Uruguay. Uh, Paraguay and Bolivia. So, 
at the time of the independence, the island were under effective occupation by uh, Spain. After the uh, independence, Argentina uh, exercised uh, sovereign authority over the islands exclusively uh, in different manners. In 1820, it took possession of the island, islands, formally, uh, formal taking of possession, which was even published in the Times in London, and there were no British protests at all. Then, the Spanish uh, authorities decided the abandonment of the islands, uh, of the presence in, in the islands because of the war of independence. So the, uh, the personnel, the garrison that was in the island was called to fight against those uh, fighting for independence. And when Argentina took possession of the islands, the islands were uninhabited again. And Argentina made the effort to establish a settlement, and when this settlement was very successful, it was the most important uh, human presence in the islands since its uh, European presence there. Um, then the British reacted through a policy of the Admiralty, which considered that this was a very strategic, important place, and they expelled Argentina from the islands. So. Uh, let me speak about the British position on sovereignty. As I said, the British claim of sovereignty in 1829, when they protested against uh, the um, administrative decision of Argentina of the creation of uh, an administrative unit for the islands, they say that the islands were British because the British discovered them because they took possession of the islands in 1765 and they were there uh, until 1774 and when the British decided to withdraw from the island they didn't have the intention to abandon sovereignty. Uh, before going with the other arguments, let me make some comments about these two uh, arguments. Discovery. I said this is not a very important one but indeed the first description of the, uh, of the islands in a map was uh, uh, a description made by uh, the activity of the Spanish uh, sailors there. I'm sure you may have to make an effort in order to see the islands. Uh, but if I show you this, um, you may see South America here and the islands here. Quite a good depiction of uh, the islands. We are talking about a map drawn uh, five centuries ago. But in any case, this is not the most important question. What about the British settlement? Indeed, the British, uh, the British established, established in 1765 a garrison here. And when the Spaniards knew the existence of uh, this garrison, they requested the withdrawal of it, of it because this was Spanish territory. And since the garrison remained there, uh, they expelled them by force. So this put the uh, two uh, kingdoms uh, in a situation close to war. And in order to avoid the war, there was a uh, an agreement in 1771. Um, you have the text of uh, this uh, agreement uh, in front of you. So by this agreement, the Spanish government consented to restore the settlement, only the settlement, but reserving its rights to sovereignty. And the British declaration considered that that was enough satisfaction because of the injury caused by the forcible expulsion of the British force there, and no any comments about sovereignty. The fact is that in, 17, in 1774, the uh, British garrison uh, was uh, withdrawn, and uh, since then, the only 
uh, presence in the islands was Spanish. And when the British withdrawn from uh, Port Egmont, they went to this place, they destroyed the, the buildings that were there, and they took a plate the British had left claiming sovereignty over the islands, no British reaction, and a permanent uh, Spanish presence until that time, till the uh, Argentine independence. The two other arguments are uh, the fact that Britain had administered the islands since 1833, when they expelled Argentina, till now, and uh, the fact that Argentina would have um, dropped its claim in a given moment. And the last argument developed is self-determination. I, uh, I will examine these different, uh, these different arguments. Argentina protested against uh, its expulsion from the islands since the very beginning. So some days after this expulsion, uh, there were protests both in Buenos Aires and in London, and the British reaction was, a, I can say, a typical imperialistic at reaction at that time. The matter is closed, the islands are British, there is nothing to discuss, there is nothing to negotiate, you have to accept this. The policy of fe accompli. So, Nevertheless, the Argentine representative in London uh, protested, and since they were not even answered by the British government uh, in one of these protests, uh, the, the Argentine minister in London said, well, uh, since you don't react to our protests, you do not even answer them, so you may not consider in the future, Argentine silence as meaning acquiescence. This is a very important point. Um, and now there is a new argument developed by the United Kingdom, which is that uh, since there was an agreement uh, in 1849, 1850 between Argentina and Britain, uh, um, Argentina would have dropped its claim by way of this agreement. This is a case that arose uh, with regard to another completely different problem, which was the freedom of navigation of, uh, inter of rivers. The, the South American position was that uh, uh, European countries did not have the right to navigate, to, uh, to freely navigate the rivers uh, without the uh, uh, riparian state uh, permission. And there was a blockade of uh, uh, Argentina and Uruguay because of this, and this treaty put an end this blockade. And that's uh, the only question that was solved by this treaty, as it is very clear from the text of uh, the, uh, the very treaty, you have it in front of it, so the only question here was to put an end the difference which have interrupted the political and commercial relations between the two countries. That is to say, the blockade and the question of freedom of navigation. Because I have to say that Argentine-British relations have always been uh, very positive, very closed. Uh, Britain obviously was um, always favorable to the independence of the South American countries for obvious reasons. And the Argentine-British relations have always been uh, very good, even with probably this exception, <laughs> um, but maybe uh, Ivan will speak about this uh, later on, so I will not uh, spend too much time on this. So, it is clear that by this convention, Argentina didn't drop its claim, uh, and by the way, this is a completely new claim. Uh, the UK has never invoked this new argument until 20. So it had many occasions eh, when Argentina protested again and again. It, they could have said, well, but you, uh, you have renounced to your claim in 1849, but it never said so. So Argentina proposed even to uh, refer the matter to arbitration in 1884, but uh, the British government did not accept. 
And what is interesting is in internal communications between the Foreign Office and the Colonial Office, the British uh, government uh, recognized that the matter was still open in 1911, for instance, and there was no uh, recognition by Argentina of any alleged British sovereignty over the islands. To sum up the question of sovereignty, uh, since the main British argument about sovereignty, putting aside self-determination, is the fact that, Argent that they were in possession of the islands and Argentina had abandoned its claim, is what the court, uh, the ICJ, said in 2008 in the Pulau Batu Pute Pedra Branca case between Malaysia and Singapore. You cannot accept a, with a, an abandonment of a claim of sovereignty in, a, in an easy way. Because what is at stake is precisely something very important for states, which is uh, sovereignty. And there is nothing in this uh, history that shows a clear acceptance of the fait accompli by Argentina. So, if you compare the claims on, by one side and the other, I think that uh, undoubtedly that's my point of view. Uh, uh, Argentine sovereignty claim at the critical date was overwhelming, um, uh, confirmed, and compare both claims, uh, uh, Argentine case, the Argentine case is by far stronger. Um, in 1833, uh, one could think, well, the use of force was not prohibited. And at that time it was possible to acquire sovereignty through force. But even at that time when force was permitted and conquest was a valid title to sovereignty, conquest was subject to some conditions. There, there should be um, a state of war between the two countries and that was not at all the case. On the contrary, there was a treaty of friendship um, commerce and commerce uh, concluded between the two countries and there was no war quite on the contrary and uh, in order to have a transfer to sovereignty through conquest you need a treaty of peace by which the, uh, uh, the, the, the territory is transferred uh, to the victory nothing like this has happened um, acquisitive prescription, maybe, uh, can be also another argument that uh, may uh, arise. Officially, the British government has never invoked this. Acquisitive prescription, it is controversial whether it is uh, such a title uh, at the international level or not, but even though if it uh, were a valid title, it is also subject to conditions, and one of them is uh, the acquiescence by the, uh, the state having the title but uh, not exercising it. As I said, this was not the case. And the fact that more than a century and a half has elapsed uh, since the British taking over the islands uh, is not the fact. It's not a legal argument. Uh, we are in the Netherlands. I could quote Grotius, I think, with your permission. And um, Grotius, discussing this point, said, uh, time uh, is not enough. Uh, everything occurs uh, through time, but uh, nothing is done by time. And this is a very... A very well uh, summary of the uh, situation and the relationship between time and uh, law. By the way, uh, there is uh, a broadly recognition of Argentine sovereignty over the islands uh, at the international level. Most of the states of the world recognize Argentine sovereignty, or at least they recognize that still there is a dispute concerning sovereignty. Let me now go to the uh, last argument uh, developed by the United Kingdom, which is 
the rights of peoples to self-determination because the inhabitants of the islands are essentially British and they want to uh, remain British and they want that the territory should be considered as British. So this is, uh, this is a, a very important point with regard to decolonization. I don't have anything to say about self-determination as a fundamental principle of international law. The, the ICJ have mentioned this uh, in at least four advisory opinions and one uh, a contentious case. Um, but the crucial point, and you, I'm sure you have discussed this earlier, is who, are, or who is the holder of the right to self-determination? Because not any human community is holder of the right to self-determination. If we decide here uh, to claim self-determination, probably we will not be followed. And even more, if, they hold, if the inhabitants of this beautiful city uh, decide to claim self-determination, uh, I wonder whether this claim should be accepted. Hmm? I'm not proposing anything, please. Uh, so, what is the situation from the international legal perspective? So, you have different human communities. Hmm? Um, international law grants different rights to these different human communities. You have the peoples, you have minorities, national, religious, ethnic, etc., 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 and you also have indigenous peoples. Each of these three different groups uh, has different rights. Mm? External self determination is a right. Uh, of peoples, that is to say, uh, peoples recognized as such, uh, they may decide the fate of the territory and pursue their uh, political status uh, at the international level as they uh, consider the best way. Whereas national and other minorities do not have this right. They have different kinds of rights. I don't have time to develop them, but they do not have the right to external self-determination. Indigenous peoples, in the UN declaration uh, adopted, General Resolution 61-295, this re declaration recognizes the right of the indigenous peoples to self-determination, but with a caveat. Only within the limits of the existing states in which they uh, live. That is to say, this is a right to internal self-determination, a right to autonomy, but not a right to external self-determination. So this is a very important point to keep in mind. And as I said before, it is not enough to claim that uh, you are the people, or a people, in order to have the right to self-determination, because otherwise it would be very simple. Mm? It, it would suffice that the human community considers itself as a people to have the right. But this is tantamount to decide on its own uh, whether you are holder of a right or not. Something which by definition at the personal level, at the state level or at the people level is uh, alien to the subject itself. We as a subject of the law, we cannot decide on our own which are the rights we are entitled to. And in this uh, regard, the international practice shows that recognition, international recognitions, recognition plays a very important role. For instance, the ICJ in its advisory opinion on the wall in 2004, and quote, quoting, as regard the principle of the right of peoples to self-determination, the court observes that the existence of a Palestinian people is no longer an issue here. Then the court developed and say even the state of Israel has recognized the existence of a Palestinian people. There is no doubt, nobody denies that there is a Palestinian people entitled to self-determination. And now I come to uh, the decolonization process. There is another advisory opinion which is very important here, which is the Western Sahara, another territory to be decolonized. And the ICJ analyzed the practice of the General Assembly. And the, 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 the court noticed that in some cases, 
there was no consultation to the inhabitants of the uh, territories to be decolonized, non cronian territories essentially. And the court explained hmm, that uh, these uh, instances were based on the consideration that a certain population did not constitute a people entitled to self-determination. This is the situation we will see that uh, uh, applies to the Falklands Malvinas. I don't have time because time is passing. Uh, I don't have time to develop the whole uh, law of decolonization. You may be familiar with it. Uh, but what I will say is it is not the uh, administering power that decides uh, which territory is uh, to be decolonized or not and the way to decolonize. It is the UN through the General Assembly essentially that determines whether a territory is or not a non self governing territory, the way to decolonize, uh, and the UN decides when a territory has ceased to be a non self governing territory. Uh, this is what uh, international practice shows. If necessary, I come back. But let me mention the concrete case of the Falklands Malvinas. The first resolution adopted by the General Assembly on this case was uh, Resolution 2065 in 1965, next year, half a century after, uh, since this uh, resolution. And the General Assembly considered that this is a, a specific case of uh, uh, decolonization, one of the forms of, the, of colonialism. It has to finish, and it note, noted the existence of a dispute be, uh, with regard to sovereignty between the two countries, and invited the two governments to hold negotiations in order to settle this dispute, taking into account the interest of the population, only the interest, that was the reference, so because the British government proposed to take into account the wishes, and the resolution only referred to the interests. In, if you compare this resolution on the Falklands Malvinas with other resolutions uh, concerning other territories, the difference, I think, is uh, blatant. For instance, take the case of East Timor. Here there is an express reference to self-determination in the preamble and an express recognition of the right of the uh, Timorese people to self-determination. Compare this resolution with the resolution on the Falklands Malvinas, and you will notice that uh, the General Assembly did not recognize, did not accept the uh, uh, application of this principle to the current inhabitants of the islands. There are more than 40 resolutions in that direction. The UK attempted to include self-determination in 1985 through two amendments of what became Resolution 4021, but these amendments were rejected. So the question is, is there a, a Falklander people entitled to self-determination? The UN, as I said, has never recognized the existence of a people. We are talking about uh, an iso isolated territory, uh, whose population is controlled by the UK, the demography of the population is controlled by the UK. Uh, and it depends, the growth of this population is not natural, it depends on the economic needs of the British administration. I don't have time to talk too much about this, but you have in front of you some figures showing the evolution of the population. Um, today, as I said, there are two, nearly 3,000 inhabitants, uh, but uh, if you analyze this population, there are some elements which are very striking. First, 40% uh, of the population has lived in the islands for less than 10 years, 40%. Natives of the islands constitute today a minority. There is a strict uh, uh, migratory control. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
The second most important village, one could say, of the islands is composed by the military base. I put aside the 1,500 uh, military staff, but uh, 14 or nearly 15% of the population is people engaged uh, in the civil work in the military base. This is very difficult. This is very difficult to consider as a people, a separate people entitled to self-determination. Um, I could mention some British inconsistency in the claim of self-determination, but I think I have to stop here. But uh, if we wish, if you wish, we can refer to uh, other British attitudes uh, which are completely uh, opposite to this claim to self-determination, the Chagos archipelago, the uh, uh, situation in Hong Kong, but we don't have time. Um, I will just mention some ICJ cases, and I promise to the chairman that I will finish with this, even though he doesn't necessarily see to criticize me for the time. Uh, I, I will show you just two cases of the ICJ, or three, in which the court made an analysis of territorial sovereignty, and there were situations in which the population that finally lived in the territory had the nationality of the state having lost the case. Um, in other words, what the court did was to analyze the titles invoked by both sides, and the court remembered that obviously states have obligations with regard to the individuals, respect for human rights, but it was not the decision of the individuals that determined sovereignty. In El Salvador, Honduras case, there were about uh, uh, 10,000 uh, Salvadorians uh, living in what the court declared Honduran territory. In, and the court insisted on the respect for the rights, rights of these individuals. But this, as I said, this was not the decision based on the fact that they were Salvadorians, then the territory should be Salvadorian. The same with regard to the Bakasi Peninsula between Nigeria and Cameroon. Again, here the court said that this Nigerian human presence in the territory is not in itself a title. And uh, the court took notice of the engagement by the Cameroonian government to respect their rights. This is exactly the position that Argentina uh, maintains today. So respect for the human rights of the inhabitants, respect for their way of life, but not uh, the right to decide a dispute between their country and another one. Mm -hmm. And the original defect, I would say, by which self-determination is not applicable, is the fact that the UK expelled Argentina from the islands, refused to negotiate, refused to settle the dispute, install its own pro population, and then if you claim self-determination, I think this is a manipulation of the principle and not a real application of this fundamental right uh, uh, in contemporary international law. So I would like to finish here. Um, I will do it if I find the slide. This is the last one. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I, I would like to finish with, uh, with a kind of defense of international law and with the words a very distinguished American scholar, Julius Gebel, not to confound this with uh, uh, another person in the history whose name is close but not the same. Uh, Julius Gebel was a scholar who, may, who published a very important book on the islands on, and the, the dispute hmm, uh, in 1927. And after having analyzed the Spanish and Argentinian and British titles, uh, he came to the conclusion that Ar Spain and Argentina were right. And he finished with this word, the law which states have so painstakingly wrought to govern their relations 
is too precious a heritage to be suborned to cover the imperialistic designs of any nation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation, and I suggest that we go on uh, straight away. I'm on the floor. So. Argentina for four years. Uh, my family is Argentine. I have married an Argentine. And I was in Britain in the Falklands War of 1982. And I remember it very well indeed. So I have two different perspectives on what the dispute is about. Um, and I don't want to come to any precipitous conclusions, but I would just like to place a slightly different point of view on the dispute straight away. Um, and I'm inspired to do so by the greatest Argentine author, Jorge Luis Borges, whose first and most legendary comment on the war was it was two bald men fighting over a comb. Um, postcards of bald men. Here we have a number of images which give you a reflection that the dispute over the Falklands, or the Malvinas, I hope you'll forgive me if I just call it the Falklands occasionally, um, is, uh, is actually something which has assumed a dynamic in politics, on in both countries, which means that the dispute is no longer simply about the merits or otherwise of a sovereignty claim on a territory in the South Atlantic, but has come, become functional to other interests in the political constituencies, the power blocks, and the militaries of the two countries. It's also something which is mobilizes social passions in a way which doesn't really reflect necessarily the true nature of the dispute. That broken car is uh, what happened to the presenter of the famous BBC uh, show Top Gear a few weeks ago when he was filming in, uh, in Patagonia, in Ushuaia, with a number plate which seemed to be an allusion to the, the, the Falklands War, uh, as a result of which there was a sort of mob attack. It's difficult to know exactly what happened. Very different versions. And they fled the country fearing their lives. Some might say that's a good thing. Um, on the right hand side, there is a, this happened two years ago, a, a, a radical activist in Buenos Aires burning a copy of the newspaper I used to work for in Buenos Aires called the Buenos Aires Herald because it was carrying an advertisement placed by the Sun defending the British right to sovereignty. On the bottom right-hand side, you see Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, the Argentine president, presenting an envelope full of resolutions from the UN Decolonization Committee uh, supporting the Argentine claim to David Cameron. This was two years ago in a G20 meeting. And the last one, and a very interesting one, on the bottom left-hand side is an image from the new Malvinas Museum in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, which has been created on the precinct of the Navy Mechanics School, which was the most important clandestine detention and torture center during the military dictatorship. And I think that brings together some of the most interesting themes from an Argentine point of view, because let's remember, 
the war, which is at the center of everything we are talking about now, the war which occurred in 1982, followed an invasion carried out by the Argentine military dictatorship, which had blood on its hands. Um, and it's always important to bear that in mind, because what's happened to the claim, the Argentine claim over the Malvinas since then, has got a lot to do with the process of digesting and rethinking uh, exactly what happened. I just want to say that I've written a number of things about the, the Malvinas to Falklands over the years. Uh, one of the last things I did was, uh, was suggesting that in the long run, at some stage, it would be good to reach some sort of arrangement, a shared sovereignty of some other solution between Argentina and Britain. And this article was put up on a website, which was read by many Falkland Islanders. And amongst the comments I received from Falkland Island trolls were, he needs to do more research and less sucking up. Does analysts have some different meaning in Argentina? One who talks out of their arse, perhaps. I suggest Ivan Briscoe buy some books on modern world history and give them a read. So this is not an area in which reason uh, necessarily operates uh, particularly strongly. It's much more akin to passion. Let's go back. Let's go back to recent history. Marcelo has given an excellent overview of the original claims to sovereignty and the legal disputes which have occurred since then. I want to talk about direct political reality. 1980s onwards, the war. We haven't talked about the war. Um, I'm not going to say much about it. It lasted three months, total of 900 casualties. It followed an Argentine invasion. A massive flotilla was sent by Margaret Thatcher's government called the Task Force, to the South Atlantic. There began a, a period of uh, uh, an offensive, an invasion of the island by the, the British forces and eventual Argentine surrender in, if I'm not mistaken, June 1982. This war was essential to restoring the popularity and strength of Margaret Thatcher's government in the United Kingdom. I doubt, judging from what the opinion polls said at the start of 1982, that Thatcher's government would have won the next general election had it not been for that war. At the same time, that war was absolutely fundamental to undermining the military dictatorship in Argentina, and I think everyone here would agree that that military dictatorship was one of the most nefarious governments that Argentina has ever had. Um, now, the fact is that in 1983, democracy returned to Argentina, the election of a radical president, Raul Alfonsi, and in 1985, the trials of the leaders of the military junta. There was a report carried out by the Argentine government, uh, the military government, as to what caused the disaster, perceived disaster, in, in terms of the invasion and the failure to defend the islands once they had been occupied, called the Rattenback Report. It's very interesting, this was never officially released at the time, but the government of Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner two years ago formally released this report. It is now publicly available as a document, and it makes very clear the levels of responsibility and neglect at various levels of the military establishment. A military establishment which wanted to recreate the effect of the 1978 World Cup, which of course, as you know, Argentina won, causing an explosion of national euphoria within the country. Obviously, in the 1980s, in Argentina was principally a time of consolidating democracy, of restoring civil dominance over the military with great difficulties, um, and of economic crisis towards the end of the 80s. It wasn't a period in which the uh, question of relations with Britain was particularly important. There was a small effort in 1984 to restore relations, um, but it, it, it fell apart quite quickly. This changed in the 1990s with under the presidency of Carlos Men. What happened was that the issue of sovereignty, the sovereignty dispute over the Malvinas was placed under an umbrella. So the idea was that the two countries could pursue fruitful bilateral relations, including practical issues 
regarding the Falkland Islands, particularly fishing and oil exploration, without raising the question of sovereignty. At the same time, the Argentine Foreign Minister, the late Guido Vitella, led what's called a charm offensive towards the islanders, trying to convince them that it was in their interests to engage in a rapprochement with Argentina. And he had a certain level of success. There was no radical change of opinion, but certainly at the time the islanders did look more favorably at Argentina. The problem was Menem's government was uh, presided over a period of uh, convertibility, an economic policy which basically attached the Argentine currency, the peso, to the dollar. That fell apart um, a couple of years after Menem left office, bringing about one of the worst economic disasters Argentina has ever seen, a default, bankruptcy, collapse of the economy. And a couple of years after that, the election of Nestor Kirchner as president on a platform of defense of national interest, defense of people's interests, and an end of the traditional, well, Menem's approach of pursuing relations with powerful countries and trying to become part of the West, as it were. Uh, that's a gross generalization. There's a lot more that can be said. But anyway, you get the impression. And it was under Kirchner by 2004, 2005, that you started to see a much more intransigent relationship with Britain regarding the islands. So uh, negotiations on, sure, on fisheries, on the fishing in the South Atlantic. Um, obviously, it's difficult to control fish which want to move from one um, zone uh, of control or sovereign zone to another, the, 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 especially the squid. The squid are the most important uh, fishing stocks in the area. So there was, a, there was agreement around a commission to, to consider the management of fishing stocks. Um, that was abandoned in 2005. The uh, uh, joint oil exploration talks on joint oil exploration were abandoned in 2007. Uh, uh, progressively, there's been a more um, antagonistic stance taken by Argentina, including uh, restrictions on the use of, uh, of ships carrying the Falklands ensign uh, using uh, ports in Argentina or in countries in the Mercosur bloc. Most recently, in 2013, the passage of a law uh, which would mean that anyone, in, any executive involved in oil exploration around the Falkland Islands could be liable to up to 15 years prison in Argentina. But this is the Argentine side on the British side, as Marcelo has said, constant reinforcement of military presence, 1,000 to 1,500 troops, for Typhoon aircraft, for Navy vessels, uh, a determination basically not to, uh, not to give in, not to talk about it, not to bring up the question of sovereignty on the basis primarily of a self-determination, the so-called self-determination of the Falkland Islanders. Um, well, that's the background. That is, is, is where we stand at the moment. This is from The Economist a few months ago, and this shows the oil and primary oil and gas exploration zones. Uh, one of the theories behind the British determination to defend the islands in, uh, in, in 1982 was the oil possessions. Uh, I'll discuss this a little bit later. Let's just put it this way. It's been a rather disappointing experience. Uh, that the theory was there were 60 billion barrels of oil in the waters around the Falklands. Uh, so far, there, has, uh, there, there have been Obviously, there have been oil fines, but none which have been commercially exploitable. And with the falling price of oil, it's somewhat doubtful that they will be in the, in the coming years. Oh, okay, I seem to have made a spell. Okay. Anyway, a questionable dispute. Um, what I want to do is, 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 is I, I, I appreciate what Marcelo was saying, but I just want to raise some serious questions as to, is this a dispute which is based in real needs or real perceived grievances, or has it, as it were, become an epiphenomenon on top of a, an issue which is really not of central importance to either country? That's what I'd like to question. I do not think the question of sovereignty over the islands 
is a matter of integral national importance to either country. In an ideal world, where passion was replaced by reason, it would be perfectly easy to negotiate a, a, a joint solution to the islands. But unfortunately, that world doesn't exist at present as a result of the history which I've just described. Let me quickly go, go through some of these reasons. A valued possession. Well, the territory of the Malvinas Islands is a 1,244th of the total Argentine territory. It's a tiny fraction of, of Argentine land mass, right opposite on the mainland, opposite the, uh, opposite the islands, you have the provinces of Santa Cruz and other Patagonian provinces. Vast, extremely unpopulated areas. Argentina just has no need for more land. Um, on the British side, it's very important to bear in mind that prior to the Argentine invasion, in London, in the government, in Margaret Thatcher's government, negotiations, idea of handing back sovereignty to Argentina for financial reasons was extremely well advanced. Um, even during the war, Thatcher was willing to negotiate some deal on sovereignty as an acceptable price to pay, as she, as she put it. And this is something which has now uh, come to public light from the official documents of the time. So the British intransigence is not something which is actually justified by history. It's not something which is justified either by the British approach to other small overseas island territories, notably Diego Garcia and the Ascension Island, where they've been quite willing to move populations about um, in, in exchange for um, geostrategic interests. In Diego Garcia, basically the population was moved because the United States turned, wanted to turn it into a, a military base, which it still runs in the, in the Indian Ocean. Also, I want to secondly bring up the question of rival histories. I mean, Marcelo's explained very well the different versions of history. There are a few bits and bobs I could throw in there just for provocation, but I don't think I will, um, because we could go on arguing about that. There are different versions of, versions of history. But I find the whole notion of establishing legitimate land claims somewhat dubious in a continent which was, uh, which, uh, where control was uh, assumed by Spain on the basis of what was called the requiramiento, the requirement. This was a document which Spanish conquistadors um, read out aloud in Spanish to natives once they arrived in the Americas. The natives didn't actually speak Spanish when they arrived, but never mind. Um, saying that you will now effectively submit to uh, Spanish uh, uh, control and that your hearing this message is effectively a sign of your consent to it. Um, and on the basis of that, the Spanish Empire came into existence. Well, if that was the original land claim or sovereign claim, one is doubtful as to anything which happened thereafter, quite frankly. But, uh, you know, there are many legal fictions being thrown around here, and, and I think uh, the question of, of entitlement to the land, either Argentina or, 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 the, or the Malvinas, is, is one where... You know, we can raise some interesting questions. Hollow and contested words. Diplomacy, self-determination. That's absolutely right what Marcelo has said. What actually does self-determination mean when we're talking two or three thousand people? Well, I think there, is, there, are, there are really serious issues to raise because if there is a claim for self-determination. Well, why couldn't the Malvinas then convert itself into an independent nation state? Well, it wouldn't be sustainable because with that level of population, it's difficult to be able to maintain the, the fundamental apparatus of, of statehood for, for, for a start. But, um, but at the same time, let's look at the details of the referendum carried out in the Falkland Islands last year. Um, on the question of whether to change or not the, the status uh, or, of the island. There were, a, uh, there were a total of 1,516 votes out of an electorate of 1,650. 
there were 1,513 voting in favor of the status quo, the, 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 the islands would remain part of the British, uh, British crown, and three voting against. Now, one might say that there is no entitlement of those people to self-determination. They are not a people, they are a transplanted population, a colonial product, and there is some justification to say that. But at the same time, there are facts on the ground, political facts on the ground, which is that you have a population, over half of which were born in those islands, or nearly half at least, which does not wish to change the rule it is under. And that is a fact which sometimes the Argentine claims and campaign for sovereignty doesn't always recognize in full. There is a question of not just self-determination, but political legitimacy, which is very important to mention. Militarization, obviously, the, the current Argentine campaign to diplomatic campaign for the Malvinas is a purely diplomatic campaign. It, it complains very strongly about the British military presence on the island. It's led by an Argentine former senator called Daniel Filmus, former senator or current senator, I'm not sure. Um, obviously, there is, a, there is a strong case to be made that there is a, a British military presence, but we always should bear in mind that there is a British military presence because there was an Argentine military invasion. And lastly, the question of, of democracy. Who, what constituency is entitled to take the decision as to the future of the Malvinas or the Falklands? Is it the British public? Is it the Argentine public? Is it the islanders? Or is it a mixture of all three or two? It's a very difficult decision. There are the primary fundamental questions which have to be resolved before a democratic result, even this referendum, is one which, uh, which should necessarily legislate as to the, as to the, um, the sovereignty of the islands. I mentioned the uh, new material interests. Is there a question of oil? When oil exploration did begin in earnest in 2010, 2012, the, the government of Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner began its diplomatic offensive, a strong diplomatic offensive, in Latin America and other fora, demanding that the issue of the, uh, the sovereignty be reconsidered. But the fact of the matter is that that is not such, uh, of such relevance. Most, the greatest stream of income going into the, into the islands is from fishing licenses. And that is a considerable source of income. So when, when two years ago, a capita income in, uh, in the islands was in the region of about 18, 90,000 euros per capita, which is a reflection of the large value of the fishing licenses, of the squid which is being fished there, against the very small size of the population. The British government puts a lot of funds into the islands. It has created, even though the population is very small, a secondary school. There are facilities for uh, students to study in university in Britain, special grants, uh, special flights which carry people who in need of treatment, hospital treatment, to the Bryce Norton Air Base in Britain and then on to hospital, usually in Oxford. So there, are, there is a very important expense uh, um, which Britain uh, puts into it without actually getting much back. And lastly, as to you know, seeing everything in terms of black and white Argentina, uh, Britain, I would just say that you should bear in mind there are lots of divisions within both Britain and Argentina as to the validity of the claims. In Britain, there are many commentators, including some very senior uh, columnists, very close to the British establishment, Simon Jenkins, Max Hastings, who cast great doubt on the merits of the British claim to the islands. Max Hastings himself was a correspondent during the war for the Malvinas in 1982. Whereas in Argentina, uh, a group of very leading, really leading intellectuals in Argentina signed a document a few years ago calling on the Argentine government to reconsider its campaign for sovereignty and put to one side that campaign to consider what the islanders' wishes actually were. So there are, you know, there are, uh, opinion is uh, fragmented on both sides. I'm not sure how much time I've got left. Um, we can take another five, ten minutes. Uh, five or ten minutes. All those issues would suggest that the, the, the nature of the dispute is 
a lot more complicated in that it doesn't have this, this deep strategic importance to the state on either side. It does have, however, well, in my job at the Klingendale Institute, we study war. Uh, we study conflict. And one of our favorite words to describe the origins of war is ethno-political, which is when you have basically ethnic grievances mobilized by political actors uh, leading to armed conflict, which is obviously one of the most important causes of, of, of armed conflict. Um, I would actually say that in the, in the case here, we're not talking about um, ethno-political, we're talking about emoto-political uh, political emotions, and these are what are manipulated on both sides through the memory of the war in 1982, which is, which is absolutely fundamental to, to what went on. This is the most famous and the most dreadful, I have to say it's absolutely deplorable, uh, front page of the Sun newspaper in 1982, gotcha. This was when the Belgrano was sunk by a British submarine, cost of 320 lives the British tabloid press celebrated. Um, there were a lot of front pages like that. The emotions in Britain in 1982 during that war should never be discounted. It was a very powerful experience. I lived through it. We had spent the 1970s and the early 90s, the 80s in Britain being told that we were a country in decline, the economy was on the edge, that we had to go and get new funds from the International Monetary Fund in Washington, and everything was falling apart slowly but surely. And then, all of a sudden, thanks to General Leopoldo Galtieri and his junta in Argentina, Britain had the opportunity to show itself that it could send a naval force to the other side of the world and win a war. And this was something which had incredible emotional significance. Regrettably, but there's no doubt that that's the case. Um, an excellent commentator on this, Anthony Barnett, has called this the Falkland Syndrome. And he, he connects the Falkland Syndrome to Tony Blair's wars 15, 20 years later, including the dreadful uh, decision to uh, participate in the war in Iraq, and to the current uh, willingness of David Cameron to join any military effort to, uh, in the Middle East or North Africa or wherever it may be, is the predisposition to engage in military action anywhere in the world uh, to, uh, to, as, as an assertion of uh, national power. When victory in the Falklands was declared, Margaret Thatcher gave a very famous speech in Cheltenham. Famous, not for the right reasons. She declared as follows. We have ceased to be a nation in retreat. Britain found itself again in the South Atlantic and will not look back from the victory she has won. This is pure nationalism, pure patriotic pride at its most exploitative. And this was a poster put up by a party which is a faction of the ruling coalition in Argentina at the moment called Nuevo Encuentro. Uh, IPF is the oil company which was renationalized two years ago by the government and the Malvinas, Son Argentinas. What this suggests is that actually the issue is not just about the Malvinas, it is about a reassertion in Argentina of national sovereignty. And there are a number of issues which I've raised here as to saying what interests are actually being served by the Falklands or Malvinas dispute on both sides. What factions, what constituencies, what need for distraction. Um, obviously in Britain, the military constituency is very important. As one observer, Anthony Barnett himself wrote, we don't have a navy so that we can go and defend the Falklands. We have the Falklands so that we can justify having a global navy. The idea that is for the military, with the, 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 the obligation to defend the Falklands, you can justify high levels of military spend. The, the spend, the annual spend on defending the Falklands is in the region of 400 million pounds. Um, political coalitions, obviously. It's very difficult for a Conservative Prime Minister to give up on the claim over the Falklands without suffering terrible repudiation and criticism in the conservative press. There's anti-imperialist rhetoric in, uh, in, in, uh, in Argentina. The vulture funds demanding full repayment on defaulted Argentine debt. The British and, uh, and, uh, and their claim over the Malvinas and various other interests are regarded by the current government, or members of the current government, including the president, as part of something of an imperialist plot to 
uh, undermine Argentina within the, the Falklands, on the other hand, a fear of Argentina and fear of what the Argentines represent and could do is very live indeed. These, these, are, these are fears and, and conspiracy theories which are very live on either side and very difficult to undermine. I think also, on practical terms, the, the Malvinas is a, is a diplomatic lever, something to put out there for Argentina to assert itself on the international stage. Um, and it also brings an assertion of strength and of state power and of state will without actually any consequences because nothing fundamentally uh, right now is going to happen. There is not going to be an Argentine military invasion because the, there is no will to carry out such a thing and the Argentine military has been profoundly debilitated and the British are not going to change their position at the moment one eye over to them. So it is a constant rehearsing of well-studied and well-practiced lines with no dialogue between the two sides. Or rather, a, as I say in Spanish, a dialogo de sordos. Um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail. There are new approaches, very clearly. Self-determination of a people and territorial control by another state are perfectly compatible options. You can have guaranteed that a, a, a population determines its own government, its own rulers, its own way of life, its own laws, where the, whereas the territory, which is, I think, what interests Argentina most of all, is actually regarded as sovereign Argentine territory. There is a room for a compromise. They do not mutually exclude one another. But there has to be a willingness to understand the other country's case and go beyond this excess of emotional neurosis. Um, there are potential oil break, um, ice breakers out there. Oil exploration would have been a great one because obviously it's very difficult to have lots of oil exploration and staff and engineers in on the islands without the ability to go to the mainland for entertainment, holidays, hospitals, <coughs> medical service, education, all those sorts of things. It would be very difficult for the islands to develop that without better relationship to Argentina. But maybe uh, that should be put in brackets at the moment. Lastly, I would just say that there is a positive vision out there, which is often very difficult to express, and perhaps myself sort of caught between the two countries you could express it, but I believe that it would be very good for Argentina to incorporate a full English-speaking uh, territory within its, its own sovereign territory, but recognising full self-determination of those people with cast iron guarantees and it would be very good for Britain to actually join those negotiations and recognise that it has uh, links, organic links with Latin America and that Europe has links with Latin America which continue to this day. But that is an opportunity which will maybe take in many years from now. At the moment, it's extremely unlikely. Thank you very much uh, for this two very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, from uh, one from more um, political, one more pro pro from more legal perspective. Uh, but I think they are very uh, complementary because those two um, issues cannot be entirely separated, the two perspectives. However, there is also some contradiction in views in, in, on interpretation of history. Uh, but before we open the floor and actually give a word to our speakers again, uh, let me just um, summarize a little bit and give a few um, some, some, some thoughts for further discussion. Um, and I'm glad, Ivan, that you mentioned more the emotional and, and also personal perspective on that, because when we talk about self-determination and territorial issues, this is when, when, when debate often gets very, very emotional. Um, it's it's um, then emotions that talk, um, not necessarily law. Um, and I think there are many places around the world when we see uh, where um, self-determination claims can actually end um, and where they, when there is um, total absence of any uh, discussion. 
And I'm glad that you also mentioned your way of dealing with the problem. Um, so how, how you, you apply the old Habsburg approach, so marry, marrying the enemy. Um, so, so to say, and I'm glad it worked for you. And, and we didn't have that, that mode of international dispute settlement in the, in the, in the textbook. Um, but I will start here. What uh, Marcelo said, quoting Grotius, um, time is not enough. I think we indeed see that in international law, if we, even if we look more recent practice that has developed after World War II. If you look at the Northern Cyprus problem, um, after four decades, it still hasn't been settled. And, and um, internationally, um, the either Turkish occupation or the um, in, or independence of Northern Cyprus um, hasn't been internationally confirmed. I'm avoiding here the word recognized because then we could um, discuss um, the effects of um, in, international recognition. But let's call it like that. So it hasn't been internationally accepted. Um, then. In 1960s, there was the debate surrounding um, southern Rhodesia uh, that declared independence illegally, and um, the case was uh, was only then settled when when um, when um, the population of the territory, which is now known as Zimbabwe, uh, properly exercised the right of self determination. Um, however, I'm wondering how far in history can we go and still claim um, time is not enough. Because when it comes to territorial entitlements, um, we can go back to, let's say, um, 1900, but then, uh, but then somebody else would say, well, let's go back to 1850. And then somebody else would, say, would go and say, let's go back to 1800. And then, Marcelo, you... Um, you identified the, the critical date, um, but as you, as you identified also, um, international law has changed because of the development of the, of the proposition of the use of force and because of the development of the principle of self-determination, uh, mm -hmm. to which I will return um, in a minute. So can, can we actually operate in the danger zones in the danger zone of international law in the 19th century. Uh, because nowadays um, we, we, do not, we do not talk about um, a session anymore, uh, discovery, conquest, so that we come and pitch the flag, flag and, and, and then discuss and then argue who was there the first and establish a settlement. And could actually then maybe we say, well, since France Establish its first settlement, which have just um, solved the problem, the, the dispute. So the, 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 the islands are actually French. And this was not entirely serious in mind. Um, trying to illustrate the problem of how far back in history do you actually go, and on what basis do we identify the critical date. Um, my second remark is on, on the right of self-determination. Indeed, this is a controversial concept and, uh, and, and the famous British international and legal scholar Ivor Jennings said, well, on the first side, this, is, uh, this principle looks very reasonable. Let the people decide. But the problem is the people cannot decide before somebody decides who the people is. Uh, and we are dealing with Self-determination is all about that. Um, deciding who the people is. And how self-determination is elaborated in the relevant provisions of international law, um, it is a right that belongs to the people, not territory. Which is then another problem if we are dealing with a territory that was initially uninhabited. Um, so, and, and, and the entitlement then rests in the people um, who, who populate the territory, not in those, uh, not, not in the territory itself. Um, 
again, then we run into the problem, do, does the population of the, of, of the islands constitute a people for the purposes of self-determination? Again, um, what is a people? We, we do not really have an adequate legal definition of that. And I think this is more of a sociological, anthropological um, issue. Um, and how we think of, of a people so having the same language, the same, um, the same culture, the same identity, it is then also a bit difficult to distinguish peoples and minorities. And at the end of the day, since we are here in Limburg, um, is there a separate identity of, of the people of Limburg? So can we, can we say that Limburg constitutes a people for the purposes of self-determination? Um, it we could we could we could well debate that, um, and and I, I I think it would be perfectly plausible uh, yes, and at, at the end of the day, I mean it, it's also I think um, a, a, a difficult issue to discuss here because we are right on the border with Belgium, and we are bordering both the Walloon and and the Flemish. Um, um, regions of, of Belgium, so, so, so we could e indeed have a very emotional debate on self-determination here. Um, but going back to the Falcons Malvinas um, question, my, 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 uh, my observation here is, aren't we actually trying to go then uh, too much into this um, definition? Well, you need for territorial entitlements, you need to prove that you are a separate people for the purposes of self-determination. But, but is this necessarily the case? Let's say um, there is a state of, of, of Vatican, and I don't think we, we, we have the people of Vatican. Um, or we, um, and, and it exists as an independent state. Or, is, or, or history can sometimes, there's no separate people at one point, no separate identity, but governance in separation of um, and, and, and specific historical circumstances can create an identity that is different um, from, 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 from the rest of the population or this is different from any other identity. Um, and don't we, um, don't we actually can we recognize that there is a strong identity, nevertheless, of the people of the Falcons Malvinas? And I'm then going to what Ivan proposed. Can, in today's state of international law, can a territory be transferred, transferred to another sovereignty if the, ter if, if the population of the territory does not agree? and specifically rejects that because on the other hand um, on the other hand Britain is often criticized that it honored its treaty with, with, with China on the, Hong, on, on, on the fate of Hong Kong um, and that the people of, of Hong Kong should have been asked whether or not they would um, like to be transferred uh, back to China and if Let's say if the population of the Falklands Malvinas decided they didn't want to go to Argentina, but would actually rather go to um, move back to the UK, then then we would have the uh, then, then being transferred to Argentina, we could have actually quite a similar problem as elsewhere. Um, let's say Chagos, um, where where the population was removed from the territory from their homes. So these are just some thoughts that I would like to um, throw here for, um, for debate. And maybe if, if I give a couple of minutes to the speakers and then I will um, open the floor for your questions. Thank you. Well, there were many, many questions, comments, both for, uh, with regard to um, Ivan and Yurik's uh, presentation or comments. Um, first of all, 
reason against emotion. Um, I think that our function as lawyers uh, is to bring reason to politicians, um, diplomats, etc., etc. Um, something else. International law is the common language we all have. And um, uh, try to convince those who have the uh, decision making power to respect international law. Uh, it's, a, it, it's our basic uh, social function, I would say. So, respect for international law. The question is not here whether Argentina needs more territory or not, uh, as Ivan mentioned. It's not a matter of, uh, well, Argentina is a big country, no need for these islands. Uh, this is not the question. Uh, any dispute all over the world, and this is not a, a question of emotion, it's a question of justice. So if a territory belongs to one state, according to international law, it's a matter of respect uh, of international law. The war, 1982 war and its impact in the dispute. It is true that uh, the military junta governing Argentina resorted to war. Uh, this was an illegal attempt to exercise sovereignty. Uh, and all the democratic governments that uh, succeeded since 1983 till today uh, have have condemned the use of force, had uh, uh, declared that Argentina will never use force in order to recover the exercise of sovereignty. This is a permanent commitment uh, which is even uh, inscribed in the Constitution through international law means. Mm? Uh, there is no threat. So the argument used by the UK to justify the military base in the island is not real, there is no threat, there is a consistent and unanimous political position of Argentina and even, as I don't said, in practical terms it would be impossible <laughs> taking into account the situation of the armed forces in Argentina. So, uh, but the fact that the uh, Argentina resorted to force in 1982 has not changed the, the crucial issue. That is to say, there is a sovereignty dispute. The fact that uh, there was a war, it didn't change anything, legally speaking, and that was even recognized by the General Assembly in November 1982. The General Assembly again adopted a resolution in the similar terms I mentioned to you uh, when I um, showed uh, Resolution 2065. That is to say, there is a need to settle this long-standing uh, sovereignty dispute, nothing changed by the war, legally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with regard to the referendum, uh, yes, the, so there was a reference, a referendum organized by the British authorities in which only British, British citizens could vote. In order to vote, you have to be a British citizen, living uh, for more than seven years in the islands, but you have to be a British citizen, in order to determine whether the islands should be a British overseas territory. This referendum was not organized by the UN, it was not supervised by the UN, it was not recognized by the UN. It, indeed, there was just one country in the world that supported this referendum, Canada. Um, there is another point which is very important, is there is a dispute. Everybody recognizes that there is a dispute. Nobody can deny it. So you have one state claiming terri sovereign, uh, territorial sovereignty, the other claiming the same, one claiming that self-determination applies to the inhabitants, the other no. There is a dispute and there is an obligation in international law to settle international disputes through peaceful means. That is to say, you cannot say, we are, we are right, you are wrong, we will not negotiate. Or uh, we will not negotiate, as the British government says, until the islanders ask us 
to negotiate with you. That is to say, if our British citizens did not, uh, does not ask, uh, do not ask us to negotiate with you, the situation will be the same. This is also a, a policy of power. That is to say, I control the situation and you cannot do anything to change it. This is cr uh, crude uh, power policy. Um, with regard to your comments, time. Uh, well, he mentioned, yes, but uh, how far can you go in history? Uh, well, I can say uh, that I even personally participated in territorial dispute before the ICJ in which the states were discussing uh, and invoking facts of uh, 18th century um, or, or even uh, earlier in Honduras, El Salvador, for instance. So uh, there were documents uh, from the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. What is the crucial question here? Because someone may say, yeah, there were other territorial uh, injustices that were committed all along the history. But the crucial question here is that this dispute is still open. Since 1833, Argentina is protesting, requesting to settle the dispute, and you have the other side, which is more powerful, stating that there is, no, there is nothing to negotiate. Uh, this is the crucial question. Since the matter is open, the other, you may mention other uh, territorial injustices all over the world, but these matters were closed. At one moment, there was a treaty, there was a situation, a legal situation, which put an end. Here, no. And this is the main difference. With regard to self-determination, I don't believe that this is a matter of sociological or anthropologic determination, because each of us may have a different sociologic notion of, of people. What is a people? According to Yuri, uh, here in uh, Limburg, you are a people. I don't know. I would like to, uh, uh, to, in to interfere in the domestic affairs of the Netherlands. This is not my, 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 task, my task today. But here you have a legal so you need a legal definition of people, which is uh, one you can find in the state, in, in the international practice, in the practice of the UN, in the practice of states. Mm? Uh, it's the same if you say continental shelf. Well, if you ask, if you ask a, a geographer, uh, maybe he will or she will have a specific idea what the continental shelf is. But if you ask uh, an international law, lawyer, uh, he or she will go and have a look at what the United Nations Conventions on, on the Law of the Sea uh, define, continental shelf. And maybe both definition, mm, both the geological definition and the legal definition do not coincide. Mm. And uh, there is no question of transfer of population here. Argentina is now proposing anything like that. So, uh, Argentina is just saying those inhabitants are there because of uh, the fact that the British government expelled Argentina, refused to negotiate, installed its population, and then you cannot ask the population. <laughs> this, imagine other situations in the world, because if you accept this, uh, for instance, just to give you an, an example, a contemporary example, uh, would the Israeli settlers decide whether their settlements should be kept in the West Bank or not? After all, you can say uh, they are there uh, now. There are at least two, two generations. There are people who were born there. Uh, they have the... Uh, you mentioned the same culture, the same language, etc. Well, they, they meet all these conditions you, you mentioned, but uh, would it be in accordance not only with international law, but even with moral, to recognize that uh, uh, a population that was established there uh, in a way which is not in accordance with international law should have to decide whether they remain there or not. So there is a problem. 
And also keep in mind what I mentioned with regard to the population of the islands. It is true that some people were uh, born there, but today it's less than half of the population. It is true that some people uh, may come uh, different generations living there, but this is not enough to consider that uh, they have to decide. So this, there are imagine there are solutions, and in this point I agree with Ivan. Um, there are solutions, and they were even mentioned during the during the, the, the relative short time in which there were some negotiations. Um, for instance, solutions like in Hong Kong, in which you have a special uh, administrative uh, region mm, which uh, has self-government, Chinese sovereignty but uh, self-rule. Uh, there are many possibilities. Um, it is one side th that rejects any discussion, not both sides. Mm? I so, think, yeah. So Thank you. And I now, um, we'll give if, if Ivan, if you have any um, brief points. I just make uh, very, very brief points. I just want to. This uh, this is a paper about the referendum of last year. Just to be absolutely clear on the population, uh, country of birth of the population of the uh, the, the Falkland Islands, um, 1,339. That's out of 2,840 were born in the Falkland Islands. 800 were born in Britain. 181 born in Chile and 38 born in Argentina. So, you know, it's a population which is not, um, I don't mind using the word, racially homogenous. It's not pure-blooded British by any stretch. But it is one in which there is a determination, as the referendum showed, to remain part of, of Britain. Now, I think it's incumbent from a very practical point of view on Argentina to prove that it is... They are that the Argentine state is a safe pair of hands for these people. Um, and I think it would be interesting if Argentina regarded its mission um, towards the, the Malvinas less uh, 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 of one of reasserting its quite valid claim to territorial sovereignty and more a question of trying to convince the people um, that it would be in their interests over the long run to form, form some, fort uh, some sort of arrangement with Argentina because otherwise it's going to end up with some um, inevitably some form of transplantation of, of population and the whole cycle of historical grievance and injustice just continues all over again. So um, that's a very practical political point of view. Uh, thank you very much. And now I will collect uh, two or three questions. Uh, please uh, raise your hand and identify yourself. Come on, <laughs> don't be shy. Um, uh, yes, uh, can, uh, you, uh, you, can, can you shout or...? <laughs> Thank you, Azar. Um, any any other questions? Um, please. Um, yes. Well, hi. My name is Ben Trumanski. Yesterday, I was reading in the Clarion, in Buenos Aires, a newspaper, that Argentina is going to take the seat of the Security Council of the United Nations, and that it's going to raise two points, like in Yadena, according to a minister of Russia, and it's going to have the full support of Russia. That is uh, the recognition of the of Palestinian state and to have a session to the UN. And the second is about the Malvinas Islands and the recognition of the sovereignty of Argentina, according to that minister of Russia. And how is the Russian support going to affect if it's it's actually raised by Argentina in the Security Council this issue? Uh, and and. and 
Um, I'll take one more, and then we'll give the um, floor to the speakers again. No one? Okay, you're all eager to be upset. <laughs> okay. We can stay until 8 o'clock if you like. No, no, to be serious. Uh, well, there were two questions, one strictly legally, one, and the other uh, political, so we decided to uh, uh, share these uh, questions. Um, I, I will just ask the, uh, the legal one. What was the situation between 1849 and 1921? 41. 41, yes. Uh, yes, I, I read uh, a British scholar wrote uh, a, a paper on that, uh, saying that uh, Argentina did not protest during that time, did not uh, advance the claim. Well, this is untrue, as simple as that. Uh, so, uh, in 1840, and the messages of the president, so that was also a point. Well, it is not necessary to have a message of the president in order to have, a, to, to maintain a claim. So you may maintain a claim for, by different ways. Hmm? Um, it is uh, true that there were no protests. Uh, of Argentina between 1850 and 1884, that is to say 34 years in which there were no protests. Um, 34 years in which there were no protests. So during that time, uh, well, there was a civil war in Argentina, uh, even the state was divided uh, in the 50s of the 19th century. Uh, Buenos Aires became independent from the rest of Argentina, there were two different states. Um, um, I, as I mentioned, in 1849, Argentina claimed uh, sovereignty and said, you don't answer, you say that the matter is closed, for us the matter is no closed, silence cannot be considered acquiescence. Um, and then you have to compare and here maybe you are familiar with the notion of estoppel, probably. Yes, you are. I don't have time to explain you, but uh, you have the professors of international law who will do it very well uh, next week, I suppose. Um, 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 Britain kept silence between 1774 and 1829. You may be better mathematician than me, because it is well known that professors of law are very bad at mathematics, but this is by far more a long lapse of time. So, and in spite of that, Britain considered that, that its silence was not a way to lose its sovereignty. So, 34 years, then Argentina came again, Mm -hmm. uh, I will not uh, explain you the whole history, but uh, in 1884 Argentina came again with its claim, proposed to defer the matter to arbitration, Britain rejected. Um, and then uh, this 41 year, uh, 1941, this is completely absurd as a reason, because I mentioned even that in 1911 the British government considered that Argentina had not recognized British Sovereignty. So there were many, many actions by which Argentina continued to consider the islands of Argentina. Even before the uh, International Postal Union, I could mention many, many, many situations, even between discussions between the British ambassador with the Foreign Affairs Minister. Uh, there, are, there are many facts uh, that in the 20th century showing that Argentina can. Your question. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, this is an interesting point. I, I, I didn't actually catch that yesterday, but I mean, Russia is is, is sort of playing an interesting uh, role game, you might say, in Latin America at the moment. Part of which is forming closer ties with Argentina. It's long had some very good ties with um, with Venezuela. And well, I mean, for Argentina, it's, it's it's a question of looking for allies and, and friends on the international stage to support its claim. 
and Britain will continue to do what it has been doing, which is to seek uh, to undermine those ally alliances which Argentina forms, and it's one of its main weapons of doing so is uh, picking off the support which Argentina has within Latin America, obviously through Chile, to an extent less so than before, through Uruguay and through other countries. So, I mean, Argentina's got to be, uh, you know, is obviously very aware, as are Britain, that, you know, these alliances can, can come and go and change. As regards to the UN Security Council, obviously, um, Britain will continue to depend on um, the support of the United States, as it did in the war of, of 1982. So, nothing changes. Thank you very much. And it's, it's already past six o'clock, so I will just uh, thank our speakers. Um, I will uh, thank Fabian um, again for organizing this uh, event. I, I think we all enjoyed it very much. And I will conclude um, to actually, uh, because there are many students of International Dispute Settlement course here, and I really appreciate it because you have your exam is next week. Um, so that in, 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 in the first lecture we addressed the issue well before any settlement can start, we need to establish whether or not there is a dispute. And, and as Marcelo outlined here, the original one of the problems here is that one side thinks there is a dispute and the other side thinks there is no dispute. Um, so and um, with, with these words I will conclude and thank again to Fabian and our speakers.